for um, Abe starts his talk for us today about um, repentance and confession. I wanted to um, hand out these roses. If you can take one and pass them down, I'll explain why. Are they what? Dethorned. You have too much faith. No problem. And, yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, let me, and we'll do the same thing with these cards over here, um, take one and pass it down. So, um, there is a ministry that um, Abuna Elisha, one of the priests in the church, is responsible for called um, MFC, Mission for Christ, and under MFC, there's a sub-ministry called Leaving the Jar. And this ministry is uh, focused on helping women and children, and if there's men, um, that are being um, used sexually for money. So they're being traded for money, they're being sold for money. Um, and the little business card that you're getting has the information about MFC and LTJ. So. We ask that you pray for that ministry, uh, go to the website, learn a little bit more about the fact that there is a lot of um, sex trafficking that happens in the United States. Um, so this is kind of just a little bit, uh, uh, our little way of um, spreading awareness uh, about sex trafficking and other kind of trafficking. Um, just visit the website, that's all we ask. Uh, learn a little bit about it, understand that it's not far away from Northern Virginia. There's a lot of sex trafficking that happens here. It's like local massage parlors that you might think are regular massage parlors. They're really not. They're kind of trafficking sex workers. So look into it and pray for those and pray for the ministry. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Can everybody hear me okay? It's my first time using this. Is it okay? <coughs> so I have to speak. Oh, man. Is this better? Yes. Much better. Okay. Um, one, I'm not Abuna Elijah, um, and thank you so much for coming, even though I'm not Abuna Elijah. Um, and uh, I pray, I pray that um, the Holy Spirit will use me and use us, and use the introduction that John um, just gave here to kind of not squander this opportunity. I really would hate for this to be just a night, especially on a topic so important as this, and um, come out of this not having the taste of actually repentance and the goodness of it, um, because it's really all about kind of what John was talking about in this ministry. It's, uh, it's uh, about being unchained from a lot of things that we uh, find ourselves trafficked in sometimes. Um, and so if you can, Make this kind of a prayer night rather than just a, a talk that you're listening to. Really lift up your hearts um, so that God will reveal where we need repentance and also allow us to hear his sweet voice because that's what repentance is about. And um, I think John talked about the need for repentance before confession. And I saw that on the outline we were talking mostly about confession, but I, I think it's the sacrament of repentance and confession. And unless we really understand repentance and understand what sin is, we won't really be able to benefit from the fullness of the sacrament of actual confession. Um, so please, again, pray that we don't squander this opportunity. Okay. I'm going to try to manage all three things at once here. So St. John Chrysostom really sets the basis for tonight's talk. God loves us more than a father, mother, friend, or any else could love anyone else could love, and even more than we are able to love ourselves. How many of us believe that? Like really, really, like we live and breathe and 
make our choices based on that truth. Okay, two people. That's good. That's good. That's okay. Because that's the whole point of why um, we're here. And so, in terms of repentance, um, I want to first admit that I, I have repented. I am repenting. And that by the grace of God, I will repent. And a lot of us have a misconception in terms of a repentance as this single milestone in the synaxarium that happens, and that's it, right? We hear and we think of these saints, and we encounter them, and we encounter their lives, and we think, oh, that's when they repented. And then everything else was rosy, and that's it. And it was a transaction, simple transaction. And what we think of that transaction is in our head is that this erasing of sins, right? That's who of us think that way. Repentance equals erasing sins. Confession is the embodiment or the kind of the standard protocol to what happens to officially get your sins stamped free, removed from your passport or removed from this, you know, uh, book that you will take with you in heaven where God will look and be like, oh, all right, he confessed. Thank God. You're good. You'll enter. A lot of us, unfortunately, have that mentality. We really do. And it comes in from some of like the Stoic principles and some of the ideas that have been borrowed from other faiths and traditions, that this idea of your good deeds will be counted, your bad deeds will be counted, and it's a balance of both, right? That's borrowed from other faiths. And there's so many different faiths out there that do a really, really good job of promoting kind of like stoicism and asceticism, like pure removal of passions. I will not sin. There are certain notable leaders that would even go as far as sleeping next to, you know, members of the opposite sex and say, I will not fornicate. And they will put it in their mind as an act of asceticism. It's strange, but they did that. It's kind of their way of trying to remove all of these passions. But is that repentance? In the eye of God, are they repentant? Because what's the distinction here? What is repentance? And so lately, um, as saints do, they make themselves known to us and they call us out for special relationship if they see something that they feel compassionate um, towards in your life. And in this case, it's St. Peter. I think he sees the foolishness of his youth in me. And so he's made himself kind of known to me as of late. And I, I've been falling more and more in love uh, with St. Peter. And I feel like he is the perfect embodiment, at least for me, in terms of what a life of repentance is. Can everybody see the slide here? And so on the left-hand side, And this is one of my favorite paintings, by the way. It's by um, an artist named Caravaggio. And it's the crucifixion, execution of St. Peter. So on the left-hand side, we see a number of different quotes that Peter made in his lifetime that we know about, okay? First one is, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That is the first encounter that he has with Christ, At that moment, he sees Christ performing a miracle and Christ tells him, go and cast your net there. And he says, okay, I'll do it. And then all of a sudden, they catch a bunch of fish and Peter realizes how holy this man is. And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. That's the first statement. Then, press forward a little bit and we're in the Last Supper. And he says, you shall never wash my feet. And then Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Then Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Wow, it's amazing. It's a beautiful trajectory. There's something happening. And then a couple of actually hours later, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. Immediately the cock crowed. So he denied Christ three times. And then what I didn't mention here 
even after the resurrection of Christ, where Christ appears to him, he goes and he's like, you know what? This discipleship thing, not for me. I'm going to go back fishing. I'm going to go back to my old life. And then Christ comes to him and redeems him. And then finally, finally, we see what's happening on the right-hand side here. And this is after he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, I'm going to get into the details about this specific moment. But what happens here? What is this trajectory? If you are, who, who works with data? Who works with at least charts and graphs? Can you plot like a clear line? No, right? It's a series of ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. But there is kind of a trajectory, right? And I think one of the biggest things about repentance and I've told this, I think, in our junior high ministry before, and I've personally felt it myself, is that repentance is an encounter with undeserved love. And I think that's what Peter has been encountering this whole time, leading up to, finally, I will lay myself up to you. I will lay my life back to you, O Lord. And so, what is repentance? Repentance is an ongoing journey. It's a life journey. Like I said, sorry, I'm skipping ahead here. And it started off, and it usually starts off, unfortunately, like most of us. I'm not going to rely on these notes anymore. Like most of us, it's head knowledge. It starts off, unfortunately, with a macro sense of God's love for us. Peter knew all about the Old Testament scriptures. He's read Ezekiel. He's read Malachi. He's read about God's pleading for Israel to return. He's read about how God uses a parable of a lost wife that's been cheating on him and asking her to return. But it's all been head knowledge. Head knowledge. And so he counters God, and he sees power and might. It's a moment of awe. But he still says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And there's an issue here. Because what God ends up revealing to Peter along this journey is that, Habibi, I love you. I chose you. You are mine. Specifically you. Specifically you, Simon Peter. It's not this macro level. And I think a lot of us can relate to that. Unfortunately, we, we, we see all of these verses. We see John 3.16, for God so loved the world. 1 John 3.16 uh, as well. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And it's this us. And it's this macro level. But unfortunately, we don't internalize it. We don't say, he laid down his life for me. For me personally, like really, really personally. And we're going to see examples of that. And so repentance is the important, most important sign of love by Father Yeshua Kamen. He's one of my uh, mentors, spiritual mentors. And he later goes on to say repentance is returning back to the bosom of the Father. It's not about erasing sins. It's about finally acknowledging that love and realizing it. And I said earlier, like nothing changes a person like meeting undeserved love. I have a kid in my Sunday school or one of the Sunday schools and um, he was kind of, uh, he was kind of labeled as the hyperactive kid. He was like a shay kid, so to speak. Shay means hyperactive, unruly. <laughs> Um, and I remember one day he was taken out by a servant and the servant pulled him to the side and he said, I love you. I know you're meant for more than this. I rely on you so much. I have bigger plans for you in this class. And since that moment, 
this child goes up to that servant every single liturgy, even if he's dressed up as a deacon and wants to stand next to him. And no one, no one can quiet this kid or has the kind of influence on this kid like this servant. And I think that is kind of what Christ is doing with us. Undeserved love. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem is that sin is the exact opposite of that truth. Who knows what Satan means? Does anybody know? Like the Hebrew, like shaitan, I think it's called shaitan, shaitan. In Arabic, it's shaitan. I forget what the Hebrew word for it was. But does, do you know what it means, where it comes from? It means the accuser. The accuser. And that's all he does. He tells us the opposite of that truth. He tells us you are not loved. He tells us you are not chosen. And he does this weird thing that at moments of your spiritual sobriety, let's say you go on an amazing retreat with John and you have a true encounter with Christ and you experience and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you are in worship with God the Father, you come back home and he'll start telling you, that's not you. That's not you. And immediately, once you fall into sin, that's you. That's who you really are. And so he claims that our identity is really us at our worst and that we are delusional to believe otherwise. And he accuses us. He accused Job. He accused Joshua and Zerubbabel in the Old Testament. He was there. I mean, he was physically manifested, and he was saying, this guy did this and this and this. He's not right. And God is constantly saying the opposite. And so every sin that we do really stems from not believing in the truth that God has for us. Every single sin. Every single sin. You are not loved. You don't have any place in God's heart, in God's embrace. And so you're going to try to find that intimacy anywhere else. That's a sin. You don't deserve real love. And so you're going to try to find it online through you know, any kinds of imagery, the artificial kind of love. That's a sin. Everything stems from believing in that lie. And he is the father of all lies. I mean, it's the same thing that he's done since Genesis. He tells you something and he makes you believe it. And so repentance, repentance is truly living out our chosenness accepting that we are truly loved. And here's the kicker, though, because a lot of other denominations stop there. Like, all right, I'm, I'm, accepted, I'm accepting that I'm loved. That's great. But repentance is learning to love back. Because Christ makes it very, very clear. It's like, if you love me, you will obey my words. Right? My flock hear my voice and they come to me. Right? And so there's a conditional component to repentance here, and there's synergy that we've, we've known in our Orthodox Church. And so not only do we believe in His love and we embrace it, but we learn to love back. Just learn. Just learn. Because we often say in our prayers, we love you, God. But do we really self evaluate? Do I really love you, God? D do I really love you? I find myself sometimes, I, I mean, Maria's catches me all the time. Like I pause mid-prayer. I'm like, no, no, I didn't mean that. I really didn't mean that. God, I'm sorry, give, give these words meaning. Because I, I really didn't mean that. So repentance is asking the Holy Spirit, Please, please help me love him back. He is my beloved, and I am trying to be 
his. Or, sorry, the other way around. I know he is. Uh, I know I am his beloved. I'm trying to make him mine. And that's right. Yeah, scratch that from your memory and cut and paste. But that's, that's really what repentance is. And, and so sin is um, relational and not transactional. Because every example that God gives us of what sin is, every, every strong example of that has always been associated with relationships. And God is very, very clear that it's a departure of a love, a love so dear. We see it with an Ezekiel, with the adulterous woman. In Ezekiel, it describes a woman who God finds along the road and he makes her beautiful. She was filthy and he cleans her and he gives her this jewelry and he gives her these earrings and he gives her the finest clothes and he makes her so beautiful that she starts to sense her beauty and everybody objectively says, she is so beautiful. She is so beautiful. But then she walks away. She walks away. And here's the sad part. Not only does she walk away, but she starts cheating on this figure who's representative of God. And then beyond cheating, she starts, instead of having them pay for her to be with them, she starts throwing away her gifts at them. She gets to a certain point where she hits rock bottom. She's on the street. She's back to where she was originally was. And God calls it out. He says, at least, at least with prostitutes, people pay for them. But you are actually paying to abandon me. And then he comes back and he redeems it. That's sin. That's sin. And, and we sometimes look at it on a transactional basis. We say, oh, it's, it's this one thing or it's this singular thing. But it's a condition of our heart. It's a departure from a love that's extended out. The only true love that we have in our life. The other example, a prodigal son. I want nothing to do with you. I want nothing to do with you. I'm going to go. I'm going to squander everything that you've given me. Every single thing. And I'm going to go and I'm going to dehumanize myself to the point where sh I'm stooping below the point of animals. I'm, I'm eating food that the, the swine typically eat. Gladly. That's sin. They both neglected a love that was there. And so in those moments, in those moments, what is the start for repentance? For the first one, this adulterous woman, this adulterous wife in Ezekiel, she had to be stripped rock bottom. There was a pause. And the second one, the prodigal son, there was also a pause. A pause and a memory and a knowledge. And so in those pauses, those were the first steps for them to start realizing that maybe there's a truth out there other than what I've been, the lie that I've been believing. And so there's a beautiful quote by St. Cyril of Alexandria. He said, God is loving to man and loving in no small measure. For say not, I have committed fornication and adultery. I have done dreadful things. And not once only, but often will he forgive. Will he grant pardon? Hear what the psalmist says. How great is the multitude of your goodness, O Lord. Your accumulated offenses surpass not the multitude of God's mercies. 
your wounds surpass not the great physician's skill. Only give yourself up in faith. Tell the physician your ailment. Say thou also like David, I will confess my I will confess me my sin unto the Lord, and the same shall be done in your case, which he says immediately, and you forgave the wickedness of my heart. So the transition here, and the only thing that we have to do, and I have it underscored, give yourself up. Give yourself up. Give yourself up. And sometimes that means, like we said in the example of the adulterous woman, involuntarily, and sometimes voluntarily. And God is a just and merciful God. He will try everything, everything, to get you to give yourself up. Everything. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't listen. And sometimes we actively reject that. And so giving ourselves up, I gave an example of a prayer here that has been on my mind, is, is finally saying, I have harmed myself. I've done everything on my own, and I ended up wounding myself more and more. I ran into every arm out there except for yours, and I have ended up abandoned with even more wounds. I have betrayed your love more than three times. I am not worthy to be called your son, but I am here. I know I don't belong where I was, and so I am here. I have heard that you love me. I want to feel it. I want to believe it. I don't know how to love you back, but I want to love you back. That's giving ourselves up. And honestly, I don't love you back, God. I really don't. But I've done some major damage here. And if you go back to St. Peter, that first encounter with Christ, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He recognizes that he's a sinful man, but he thinks he doesn't belong there. He thinks God shouldn't be anywhere near him. But I'm saying, acknowledge that you're a sinful person and say, but I know I belong here. I know I don't belong back with the pigs. I don't belong back there. I'm told I belong in your arms. I have countless examples. I've read countless examples of this. It's a genuine, genuine come to Jesus moment, so to speak. Where you finally admit to yourself I don't know how to love you back. And that, I think, is the start of repentance. And so the pause. When can we encounter that pause? How do we have that pause? There are unintentional pauses, involuntary pauses, like we mentioned before. Some of them come from heartbreak. Some of them come from major life setbacks, surgeries, illnesses, whatever it is. C.S. Lewis says, God shouts in our pain, trying to get our attention. So those are the moments where we're supposed to be like, okay, I need you, God. That's an unintentional pause, and he will do everything he can as well to get us to those decision points. But I encourage everybody to have more intentional pauses to make it a little bit easier for yourselves so you don't have to get to the point of heartache. You don't have to get to the point of having a loved one on a you know, deathbed. You don't have to get to a point where your life is in chaos and you've done everything you can to ruin it. Have more intentional pauses. Ask yourself, on a regular basis in your spiritual canon. God, do I love you today? Has my life been an indication of a love back to you? Don't look at sin as, like I said, these little dots 
but look at sin as a direction of am I loving you back or I'm not? And then from there, you'll be able, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you, actually, there are certain things that you haven't given to God. You say you love him, but you haven't given to him your passions. You say you love him, but you haven't given to him your time. You say you love him, but this and this and this and this. And out will flow so many different things that you can work with Abuna then as part of your confession. Another way to have an intentional pause is to have moments among the saints. And what I mean by that, one of the most interesting things in, in St. Peter's life is that he convinced a number of other disciples to, for, to go back to fishing. And that's like the power of influence. But I think we need to surround ourselves by people who try to remind us that we're still disciples and we're chosen by God. And I mean by having actual like saints, having those the fellowship of the saints in their lives to tell you that, you know what, I, I want to walk in the same path as Abuna Bishoy Kandi. I want him to be my friend. I want to walk in the same path as St. Peter. Have him be my friend. Remind myself of all of the decisions of how eventually they gave their entire life back as a sacrifice, as an offering to God. The goal of repentance is to finally give yourself back to a God who's given himself up to you and for you. That's what we're called as, I mean, we've heard it in the epistles of St. Peter that we're all called to be universal priests. Who knows what that means? Do you know what a royal priesthood is or a universal priesthood? Do you know what that means? Not like, you know, black garb, beard. No, it means that we offer ourselves as a sacrifice. We give to God and we take from Him and we give to the entire world. I source my love from Him. I source my healing from Him. And I become a presence of healing for everyone. Just kind of like what Abuna does on the altar where he offers the congregation to God to heal, and then he takes back God, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and disperses it to the community, we're supposed to do that universally on a more intimate scale. We're called, each one of us, in the workplace, every single place. And so what I'm trying to say here is that repentance is finally giving ourselves up fully so that we could be healing vessels for others. How do I do that? By having fellowship with those who have already done that and have that be my barometer. Because sometimes, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that we miss, we miss the heating water. You know how frogs, and you've heard this anecdote plenty of times, frogs and hot water slowly over time will not realize that they're being boiled? That's how we are. But if you surround yourselves with the lives of the saints and individuals like the people here, like John and Mark and Nancy and wonderful people here as guideposts, then I think you'll start remembering that, no, no, I'm loved. I'm meant for something more than this. And so, like I said, repentance is learning to love back by the Holy Spirit. And so I want us to think that repentance and confession is an exchange, an exchange back. And we have to think that I am, through repentance, making myself ready for my bridegroom. Because that's the goal. The goal here is for myself to be a spotless bride for him, a holy and spotless bride. And I know some of you like might think that's a little theoretical and might think that's a little abstract. But I tell you, if we miss really that this is all about a love story from God to me, then I am missing the forest for the trees. I'm, I'm just like clearing what I think is my conscience through confession. 
But if I realize that my sins are really a response back to God saying, you know what, I, I don't love you so much in this area, then it becomes a little bit more clear. It's not this distant God who's in an ivory tower somewhere trying to see and gauge you know, what our tally is looking like. How are we doing this season? That's not how he is. But in our moments of pause, the Holy Spirit will come and allow us to hear the voice and the words of Christ. And he will ask us, do you love me? And the choice of love here is agape, sacrificial love. Do you love me, Habibi, fully? Do you love me to the point of death? Every single time you pause. And then your response is, I'm learning to. I'm learning to, God. This is the path of repentance. I, I don't love you nearly enough, but I'm learning to. And he says, it's okay. It's okay because you're chosen. For fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, and you are mine. And so, slowly, over time, your gaze, in terms of what you'll be looking at and focused at, it's going to morph from looking at yourself and looking at your what you think is filth, and you're going to start looking at him. And you're going to start realizing, my gosh, okay, I'm, I'm terrible. Sure, I have all of these stains. I, I've done this, I've done that. But he loves me so much. Look at his love. I love you so much, God. I'm starting to fall in love with you. I'm starting to fall in love with you because of your love towards me. I'm learning what that looks like. And your goal and your focus is not going to be about yourself anymore. It's about wanting to lose yourself completely in the ocean of his love. And that's what's gotten all of these saints to the point of martyrdom. That's why, that's why I love this picture so much. Because in this picture, the artist is fantastic in depicting that the only light in this entire building is coming from the one direction that St. Peter is looking at. Can everybody see that? Look how distracted everybody else. It's another day in the park. Oh, we're just executing another Jew. That's what they're thinking. Oh, just another one. To everybody else, just another day. But for St. Peter, he's looking at his love. He's like, I'm, now I love you. Now I know what that means. Now I'm willing to give it all to you. That's the goal of repentance. This is it. Anything, anything for you, Lord. He doesn't even care about what's happening to him. He's completely like distracted by the love that he has for God. If I could just dissolve in you, I would. I wish I could. And so don't trick yourself into thinking that Repentance is about feeling bad about the time you broke fasting on a Wednesday night. You know, that's not, that's not it. Don't cheapen God's love like that. You know, what, what we should feel contrition of heart about is, I don't love you enough. I don't love you as much as you want me to love you, that I'm consistently forgetting who I am to you. You know, it's kind of like, I have Gabriel here. He made a, a special appearance. Uh, he's my son in the back. And I can imagine how much heartbreak I'll have if one day I catch Gabriel hanging with a bunch of raccoons in a trash bin. You know, imagine he's just like eating a bunch of like trash like old White Castle or something like that. <laughs> I will feel so heartbroken. This is my son. He's not meant to, he's meant to have organic pureed goods. <laughs> Grass-fed. 
But that's how God feels about us. And Gabriel was like, no, nah, this is my lifestyle, man. <laughs> I'm all about that coon life, you know? <laughs> and, but that's, that's how, that's, that's unfortunately what we do. What we do. We leave the cross. We leave his arms wide open. An expression of his love. And we're like, now nah, we're good. I don't deserve that love. And he's like, just come. Just come. I will make you clean. In the story of the prodigal son, it's not the son that makes himself clean. It's the father. It's the work of God that does that. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. All you have to do is pause. Pause. Give yourself up. Kife. Enough. Sorry. Kife is enough. Sorry. I love you guys. I'm sorry. I hate when people do that. I'm sorry. Enough. Enough. And so what is confession? In the context of everything that I'm saying, think of confession and abuna as your um, wedding planner, so to speak. He's your maid of honor if you're a woman, and he's your best man if you're a man. And you go to him because you've realized the love of God towards you specifically. Specifically, I'm going to say a bunch of random names here. Myrna, Sarah, Maurice, Mark, I'm sure Nina's, all of you out there. Bishoy. Bishoy. Specifically for him. And then you go to him and you're like, I have some stains on my dress. I'm not ready for my wedding. You know what? I've, I've been on other dates lately. I haven't been faithful about my love towards him. I wish I can give him everything, but I haven't. I haven't given him my body. It's been used by other people. And I haven't given him my trust. I haven't even loved his children. I'm a narcissist. I objectify everyone and everything around me. I'm, I'm not ready for this wedding date. Help me. Help me get there. What can I do? What can I do? I know. He misses the raccoons. But that's what Abuna does in this context. He's getting, he's helping you, helping you live out that life back, that love back. And so that's why I think John said it beautifully too. Repentance has to come before confession because confession without repentance, what are you confessing like, uh, what's the goal? What's the goal? If it's not in preparation for something, if it's not within scope of a love, a response back that you've started on your own and through the church, then that's why confession comes before communion in the Eucharist. Because now, now, my dress is clean, my suit is clean, I'm ready I'm ready for my groom. I'm ready to spend time with him. And it's going to be an ongoing journey. I will continuously go to him and go to him regularly, regularly. That's part of learning to love God back. And I think the, the, the moment, really, the moment that we realize that we pretend to love God is the moment when we start actually trying to love God. If we realize, really, that I, I actually don't love you. I really don't. I say it. You're a, you've been my insurance plan. How many of us are in, in, enrolled in um, insurance Christianity? A lot of us. A lot of us. 
It's the just in case. I'll confess just in case this doesn't show up at the end. You know? I'll, confi- I'll confess just in case this might impact my interview coming up with Dwight or whoever you guys want to apply for. You know? I'll confess just in case this might impact you know, my aunt or my mom who's in the hospital. Maybe God won't hear me. But we confess because I don't love you back enough. And like the story of Peter, this is a life of repentance. Finally, I want to give you all of me. In the words of John Legend. (laughs) All of me. Isn't that so beautiful? That that's what the exchange is. That's what we believe in the liturgy. I offer you in the liturgy of of Saint Gregory, I love this so much. He goes, I, I offer you the symbols of my freedom, God. You do I give you everything. Because I realize I'm wounded. In that same portion of the liturgy, he says, you, ba- you bandage me up. You heal me. And so just start with realizing that there's no other physician out there. There's no other path out there. And there's no other meaning, really narrative, other than the fact that you are redeemed, you are chosen by him, and it's you that walks away, and he loves you so much, And he just wants you to finally surrender yourself. That's it. And I don't want us to end on a note of despair. But I love this verse. And I'm uh, sorry, this quote. I'm not going to read it off of there. Because my glasses aren't that great. But in, um, in Ezekiel, Going back to that passage that we were talking about, Ezekiel 16, God says this to the woman who's been cheated on, who's been cheating on her spouse, or who's been cheating on the love that God has for her. He says, No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you. Everybody left you alone. That's it, you're broken. No one's come for you. But you were cast out on the open field, for you were aboard on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you weltering in your blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. When I passed by you again, looked upon you. Behold, you were at the age for love, and I covered you. I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. And I entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth. Does everybody believe that? That that's what God wants for us? If it's hard for us to grasp, I think that's what we need to repent from. Because that exposes the lies that the devil has been implanting in us. He wants to do all of these things for us. When uh, Gabriel was born, I created a little song. I'm not vulnerable to sing in front of you just yet, (laughs) but I'll tell you the lyrics. Because I wanted to set him on the path of repentance. And the lyrics are, I'm a saint in the making. I'm a child of the high king. In his love, I will not be shaken. I trust in him for everything. So I'm the saint in the making. You are all saints in the making. Your repentance, your true repentance, is really established on the fact that one day, God willing, if you choose, there may be a synaxarium account of you. There might be icons of you one day. Hopefully John will have like a square footage on it, like a top right corner or mark or something. You know how they always have like, Avuna Zusima, or somebody that's involved in the repentance story. But each one of you. And if you don't believe that, I think 
think it means that you've been believing a lie. And if you don't desire that, it means you don't desire to fully give your life to God. Because when it comes to God, it's very, very binary. It's either you live for him or you don't. And so, I think with that, I don't want you to fall into despair. Let's make tonight a starting point. Let's fervently, like, ask God and come to him and say, God, I hear talks. I've been in many prayer meetings. I've been in conversations. I've heard so much about your love in Bible study but I've never felt it. And if I haven't felt it, please reveal it to me. And if you felt it, say, in all truth, God, I know you want me to love you back. I want to love you back. Teach me how. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, please. I'm willing to leave the swine. I'm willing to leave everything behind and start that process. So ask yourselves tonight, what lies do you believe in that are keeping you from accepting this truth? For some of us, it could be addictive behavior where we feel like that specific act is our only escape and source of joy and I will never be able to break out of it. That's a lie. From some other people, it could be like, I will never find true love. God's love is not enough for me, and so I will give myself to people freely, dishonoring God. Ask yourself, With that, I'm gonna, do we do questions here? Hopefully not, right? No questions. No, we have questions. Are we okay with time? You guys have any questions or comments? Ask him some questions. Yes. What you were saying about how God seeks us or like the idea that we repent, whether it's whether God brings us kind of to rock bottom or we end up, you know, being in rock bottom and then we seek God as opposed to us choosing to do that, and I think a lot of the time that we wait for rock bottom to do that, and something someone said on the grad retreat that really stuck with me was the idea of like, in our spiritual life where a lot of the time we're playing defense, and we're not really, eventually as we grow in our spiritual life, we're supposed to also be in offense. Like, mm. I'm, I, yes, initially that's how I sought God, or then how I found God. Like I was, I hit rock bottom, but if I, I can't be waiting for that every single time to find him and to repent and to come back to him. Mm. So I love what you said about just holding on to, like the saints and holding on to and like seeking God and like times of comfort, it's so easy to be like, finally, like let me just let loose or, or like do my thing, do whatever. And so I, it's, it's a good reminder that we, need to be seeking and repenting and sort of asking God in all seasons, like what is it within me that needs work? What is it within me that is not loving towards God? Mm -hmm. So I loved what you said on that. Abuna Bishoy came and um, said, the more you actually repent uh, and you realize what repentance is, you'll no longer like Confession for you transitions from I have lied, I have cursed, 
I've watched this, I've, I've done that, it becomes, I don't love. I don't love God. I don't love my neighbor. I don't love myself. You know, it becomes deeper in terms of who's occupying your heart and what's occupying your heart. And so it's kind of like what you're saying about sometimes we play defense thinking that the entire goal is for us not to sin. No, the entire goal is for us to be in God's embrace, is to be fully acting out on being his. Thanks, Marty. Any other comments? Anybody maybe have something better to add? Like, seriously, I, I, I want us to, this to be a discussion in terms of like your experience as well. Any stories, maybe anything that could encourage me before I leave about, you know, repentance or a true life repentance or a saint or somebody like that that you want to share? Gabriel? John? Has anybody here ever experienced true repentance? Is it too personal of a question? I don't know boundaries, so <laughs> I don't like. <laughs> I just <laughs> I ask anything. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What brought you there? Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I usually listen to people say these things, not say my own, but um, it's definitely when I'm going through m the hardest time or where I'm focusing a lot more on my, let's say. Um, educational, financial growth, and I completely forget that instead of chasing the earthly, I should be chasing him the same way he's been chasing me. And it's almost as if I unknowingly push him away and silence him to make me feel better about what I'm doing. And then eventually, once I hit that wall of, oh my gosh, I've been wasting time, or I just, I pushed away the one person who truly endlessly love me with just a level of love no one else could provide me on this earth. Everything just kind of comes wrecking down, the emotion comes and that's when it feels the strongest because I'm a very emotional person so that hits harder but kind of like how St. Peter's story was, there's repentance, acknowledgement, understanding and then fall into it again. So it's that constant cycle mm -hmm. and going through it. Isn't it incredible when you hear God's voice for you, even though you're like you're in the middle of filth? Like I think that is is the most healing thing, and that is the expression. I, I think that's why Saint John, the disciple and apostle, says, you know, that while we were still sinners, He died for us, but not only as this like one-time event, but while I'm still sinning, he makes himself known to me, and he embraces me. Like, I, I, had, I had a very, very similar story. I, it was in the middle of, like, hanging out with raccoons that, like, God made himself known. And you're like, what? Me? Me? For real? Like, you want me? And, and I think that in itself is so transforming. Because it's like, it's nothing that I could do, but just to surrender to you. And I know you're going to make things clean. But I just got to be authentic about it. Can I have everybody open up Ezekiel 16, verse 6? <coughs> so Ave, Ave brought up um, this chapter, and this chapter is like life transforming for me. So... I wish we could have like five weeks on Ezekiel 16. Like it's, every verse is incredible. So if you open up Ezekiel 16, verse 6, talk about God wanting to choose you in the middle of a time where no one would choose you. Mm. It says, and when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. 
it doesn't get any clearer than that.